Tyler, did you know Rocket Lab is up 476% in the past year? Uh, I know it because I just told you that 37 seconds ago. This is a high-flying stock. A rocket stock, and it's a rocket business. That was the worst dad pun you've done in all of these videos. And by worst, you mean best. All right. Okay, everybody. I'm Jason. That's Tyler. This is Investing Unscripted. We're going to talk about Rocket Lab and whether or not we think there's anything worth buying right now. Our videos are sponsored by The Motley Fool. We get to do them because of our partnership with The Motley Fool. If you like our content, please check out our special link. The Motley Fool has got some great offers for investors to help you do even better. Go to fool.com forward slash unscripted and you can get access to The Motley Fool's 10 best stocks to buy right now. Again, that's fool.com forward slash unscripted. Rocket Lab, I think one of the cool things about its business is they kind of turn conventional wisdom on its head when it comes to business. Generally, bigger is better. Scale is how you win. And in the physics of operating a business, that's true. But in the physics of putting things into orbit, it's not true, right? Well, it's not true right now. And it's kind of the way I think Rocket Lab and many uh, other startup space companies or launch specialists have gone was the idea of like, look, we can't build something as large as the Atlas rocket and get it to work on day one. That costs a lot of money and that's really yeah. hard to do. But what we can do is we can build smaller rockets and we can send up smaller payloads and we can deliver on those payloads and probably earn some contracts with government commercial. And once we have that, we can use that as, you know, leverage to build the rest of our business. And that's what Rocket Lab has done. Its Electron rocket has been quite successful, but in terms of capacity compared to some other things out there, like SpaceX Falcon Heavy, it's considerably smaller. It's considerably smaller than what United Launch Alliance was using for a long time, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad. It just makes it as a way of getting into the business. It fits where a lot of the commercial demand, and when I say commercial, I don't mean just public entities. I mean the, the demand because for those larger launch vehicles, you need to be putting a lot of stuff or a lot of high value stuff into orbit because the math gets really disfavorable. To get heavier, a heavier payload in, you need more fuel. And then you need more fuel to lift the extra fuel, right? The cost gets more complicated. And with the smaller launches, the Electron has carved out a pretty sizable portion of it. And it's been, I don't want to say profitable because Rocket Lab's not profitable. But they're getting good margin, right? They're getting good gross margin right off the bat, which you don't always see from these sorts of businesses. So the economic model certainly looks like as they continue to scale up the total size of the business and the number of launches they do, there's potential there. Yeah. And the idea too is that with this Electron that's working, they are using the money that they're earning, that higher, that high margin to develop its next iteration, which is the neutron rocket. Right now it's running the electron. It's the teeny tiny rocket and they're going to build a bigger one from here. Electron, this is, this is the kind of the, the bread and butter of the business right now. Neutron is the, is in development. Yep. And then of course they're working on a hypersonic platform as well, but that's, that's yep. years away. So go ahead, Tyler. And on top of that, they have a, a, a interesting little contract business where they build custom satellites and which I, will likely come in handy when courting commercial customers, not necessarily the government, the government kind of knows what it wants up in space, commercial customers looking to, you know, add satellite telecommunications coverage or things like that, who may not necessarily have the expertise in building satellites for that. That is a add on business that they are doing and kind of a nice way of helping to stuff as much as you can into those rockets is by making the satellites that are going to be going up with them. So it's, all in all, it's a it's a pretty good business model. It's like you said, it's still losing money because it's plowing a ton of money into research and development right now. But the signs are there. I don't want to call it exit velocity yet, but there are signs of, of a business that is starting to take off. Man, I just so many puns today. How can you not do them? We're talking about a rocket company and the stock has gone so high. They're just, I mean, they're right there, Tyler. What kind of It's almost like they went plaid. That's a different kind of rocket. That's okay. I can't wait for Spaceballs, the sequel, to come out. All right, let's let's get right to the to the to the investors that are interested in the stock and have seen it skyrocket up. Obviously, sometimes when momentum and the and the animal spirits are in your favor, Tyler, there's an opportunity to profit, and we've certainly seen that as investor interest has continued to to climb higher. But my question for you here is: We have a business that's valued at twenty eight billion dollars. But over the past four quarters, has has earned half a billion dollars in revenue. So it's extremely, again, it's not profitable. It's a long way from being profitable. You know, there's management's not hiding that reality that they're going to continue to plow money into the business. 
to try to capture as much scale as they can and really become an established leader in this space. Some people say this is a trillion dollar market, the space economy, and maybe that's true. But my question is, starting today as a $28 billion company, how much future is already baked into the stock price? And what should investors that are interested in buying today, how should they be thinking about realistic expectations for returns? Yeah. And of course, it, you bringing me on means you needed somebody to dump some cold water on something because I'm the Debbie Downer here. Half a billion dollars in sales, $20 billion market cap. We are projecting monumental growth, monumental margin expansion over the next couple of years. And to that point, a trillion dollar space economy, a couple of years ago, when you heard that, that sounded incredibly attractive because we basically had maybe two big players with SpaceX and United Launch Alliance. And then we saw Rocket Lab come in, we're like, Ooh, a third person that could attack this, that, you know, all of a sudden one trillion space gets carved up in a little bit more, but there's still plenty of room. And this is where I think it starts to get a little bit more challenging is because in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot more progress in the space industry and in competitors uh, being successful. Uh, mm -hmm. We just had a IPO a couple months ago of Firefly Aerospace, which is also you know, had successful launches. I actually had a successful launch to the moon to land a, I think it was land a probe. I can't remember what they landed, but they put something successfully on the moon, which is something that somebody hasn't done in a long time. Uh, we have Blue Origin, privately owned, backed by Jeff Bezos. So they're definitely not short cash. We also have another one that I think is going to come public relatively soon. Eric Schmidt of Google is currently leading another private aerospace company that's looking to do its first launch in a couple of months. And so all of a sudden we went from maybe two or three players to half a dozen with more on the way. And well, so yeah, you mentioned the moon, but you didn't mention intuitive machines. Their ticker is Lunar, L-U-N-R, right? And their yeah, focus and is the moon and providing like kind of services-based business as well. Yeah. So there's, there's a, like you said, there's a lot of players and it's becoming ever more. When somebody says, hey, this is a trillion dollar market, it's going to get crowded and we're seeing that yeah. happen, right? Okay, so let's circle back around to uh, applying that to Rocket Lab. What should investors think? I think the first thing I would say is massive volatility. And honestly, it's been the good volatility so far, right? Mostly moving up this year, but I think there's a massive amount of downside risk at this point. Look, it's one of those things where it could keep going like this for a while as long as Rocket Lab keeps posting great press releases and shows progress, but I'm going to tell you, you know, the first time they have a hiccup or something blows up on the pad or, you know, the neutron rocket takes longer than expected to, to develop or something like that. And they start hitting roadblocks and headwinds. Investor enthusiasm can change pretty quickly. We've seen it with other companies before and it, you know, as promising as the space economy and companies like rocket lab are do keep that in mind because not everything is going to go perfectly. This is an incredibly challenging business. We've seen SpaceX. How many, what's the one that they've been working on? Starship? Yeah. There's a decent chance Rocket Lab might have the same thing happen. Move fast and break things in software. It's pretty easy to just move forward, but move fast and break things in rocketry is really, really expensive, right? Yeah. So, and it's inevitable. It's, you're going to have failures, right? It's inevitable. So, so that's a reality. No, I think you're, I think you're right, Tyler. And, you know, just some other like, reality check. The company's going to do 20 launches this year. They did five in the second quarter. They're probably going to do a few more in the third quarter, which will get the results a little bit uh, sometime in the next few weeks. But yeah, I think you're right. I think investors should definitely check their reality. I, I would go this far, Tyler. I think for, for investors that are maybe wired more like me, buy a few shares and, and to track it and kind of watch what's going on, but not like loading up so much that you're creating like serious downside risk in your portfolio. That's how I could think about it. For more disciplined investors like yourself, put it on a watch list, continue to follow the story in the business. I agree with you. I think we're going to get an opportunity to buy this stock for a lot less than this price. I do think it's one of the more compelling businesses in this space. But at, at this point, yeah, I, I think... There's so much expectation already in the price and the space getting more crowded. I think there's no reason to, to rush here, right? No. 